So today we're talking about um, project estimation and looking into the future from there. The, the key that we're, looks like somebody's trying to join here. The thing that we're um, focusing on is trying to stick to our agile values and principles and also just some new innovative techniques that we've, we've uncovered as, as we've worked together at Smart Data. Just so you know, Mike, I'll take care of anybody trying to join. So you're all good. Just keep okay. going. All right. So a little bit about me. Uh, Katie mentioned a little bit. I um, have been a scrum master. Um, I was working at Smart Data for a couple of years, and I actually transitioned out just for a year to go out into the wild, learn a few more things. And I actually came back because Smart Data is such an excellent company. Um, I'm a certified scrum master, agile coach, and product owner. Something I love is just being part of an awesome culture. I love keeping things simple and fostering um, cultures that, that are filled with joy, essentially. Some, some background about me. I'm also a musician. I've been playing since I was 12, so I love to play guitar, and I still write music to this day. There have been a lot of organizations that I've interacted with or even worked with, um, from Google to GE, Kroger, 8451, Macy's, Toll Brothers, and all the others listed there, and even some more. So I've seen uh, quite a few different approaches to different ways of working and cultures and different approaches to estimating and, and forecasting into the future. So a little bit about smart data. One thing that we hold dear and true is that we like to have joy when we're working. So we make great software and we enjoy doing it. That's one of our key things. Back in 2006 is when Smart Data was established by Ravi. He is the founder and CEO. And we have multiple locations, Dayton, Ohio and Miamisburg, Cincinnati, which is actually new, now Blue Ash. Um, we have a location in Louisville and Hyderabad, India. And here's just some pictures just to maybe represent a little bit of what you might expect at Smart Data. Some things that stick out just looking at these pictures. There's a lot of teamwork. We're always focused on continuous improvement, how we can always improve. We like to experiment, see how it works out. If it's a good experiment and it solves a problem, we'll continue with it. If it's a bad experiment, then we, we won't continue that. Um, we like to try different innovative approaches and modern techniques. Um, there on like the bottom left here, you can see we have um, different artifacts that we use on different projects. Um, and we, we, we keep it real. We don't always use um, things on screen. Sometimes we just throw things on the wall, lots of arts and crafts, sticky notes, markers. And overall, we're just a, a big team and we like to have fun. So why are we talking about this today? There are quite a few reasons. One of the most paramount ones is that being accurate with project estimates is obviously challenging. Organizations, if you're going to be starting a project, they're generally wanting to know some sort of how much is this going to cost? And generally, they're looking for a very precise number. Often, um, teams spend too much time thinking over things instead of just getting started. And then it's challenging to see into the future. But if you can, it, it's good because it can be a potential guide of predictability for better decision making. So some things we're going to learn. We're going to learn the importance of accuracy over precision. Precision can be flawed. If we, if we approach it in the wrong way. Along that, we're going to take a look at different real world examples and some innovative approaches and techniques that we've come up with at Smart Data. And that's going to cover project estimation as well as how we forecast into the future. And we try to always align to agile values and principles as a company. And the last part is we will begin looking at different techniques to forecast into the future. So the outline is essentially going to look like this during the talk, just a, a brief overview. We're going to start with what I just mentioned, accuracy over precision and why that's important. Then we're going to get into how we actually estimate projects. 
So we're going to talk about how we prepare for it, who's involved, um, framing, and I'll get into that a little bit more, um, talking about the goal of the project and how to decompose it. And then we'll get into the actual estimation techniques. And there's going to be four of them that we talk about. And ultimately, at the end, we're going to take all those four estimate types and we're going to compare them to arrive at a final estimate. After we talk about the initial project estimation, we'll talk about ways that you can forecast into the future so that you can plan and be predictable. So we're going to uh, loosely cover story points, which is tied to what is called velocity. And then from there, we'll look at how you can use those tools to forecast into the future and make better decisions. All right, so I just wanted to start out by laying kind of a background of why um, some of these aspects are important and some of the mindset of how we got here. So I like to um, kind of distinguish between accuracy versus precision. So accuracy basically is referring to how close a measurement is to the actual outcome. Whereas precision is referring to how exact that measurement is. They're completely independent of each other. And ultimately, the best quality estimates are both accurate and precise. But if you had to choose between one or the other, accuracy is more important. And to illustrate this, let's say we have a target and I throw five darts. As you can see, they're all clustered together, but they're not near the center. So while they have a high level of precision because they're exactly close to each other, they are not accurate. There is low accuracy as they are not near the bullseye. If we did that same thing again, let's say we throw five more darts. As you can see here, they're exactly aligned to each other and they're right on the bullseye. So those are this is an example of high accuracy and high precision. And we'll take another example, throw five more darts. And as you can see, these are all equidistant from the bullseye. And if you average these out mathematically, they are all um, the same distance. So they are highly accurate. However, the precision is low as they're not clustered together. And then the last example is a little messy. As you can see, darts are spread randomly across everywhere. So there's Whoever was throwing these was very inaccurate and very imprecise. So I just kind of wanted to demonstrate so that we kind of set this mindset as we're looking at this. Another example, and I want to talk about this because precision can be flawed, especially as a human. Let's take a 20 gram widget. We'll say that it actually weighs 20.01 grams for this example. We have a scale here on the left that can measure to the nearest tenth of a gram. That's its precision level. So it cannot measure to a level of nearest hundredth of a gram. So if we were to say it weighs 20.01 grams, that is flawed precision because it's not, it's not possible for this measurement tool to actually level to that precision. Now, if we take a second scale here, as you can see, this, this one weighs to the nearest hundredth of a gram. So it can measure a precision level of nearest hundredth of a gram. But it would be flawed to say, for instance, maybe somebody would measure something and say that something weighs 20.011 grams. That's to the nearest thousandth. This measurement tool cannot measure to that precision level. So that would be an uh, example of flawed precision. So the question is, if we're a measurement tool, how precise can we be as humans? And as another example, to talk about precision and how we're going to approach things, let's say that we have three candy jars here and they're filled with M&Ms. As you can see, they're all different levels of M&Ms. As a human, kind of following how precise can we be as a human. If we were to estimate either of these three amounts, we're, we're not likely to be accurate. 
but we're likely to be per precise, but that precision is probably flawed. Now, if I were to estimate a range, say, we're, let's say that we're looking at this middle jar here, and I said there's between you know, 100 and 600 M&Ms, a range of estimate. That's likely to be more accurate, but it's imprecise because now we're working with a range instead of an exact number. Now, if we were to compare all these jars, so I could say, well, this one's definitely lower than this one, and this one's definitely lower than this one. I can do it really quickly, and it's both accurate, and it can be precise. Because, for instance, I could say this jar maybe has three times more M&Ms. Maybe this jar has five times more M&Ms than this first jar. So the good news is humans are great at comparing. If you've noticed when you glance at this, you can instantly see and compare that this one probably has the least, this one probably has the most, and this one's in the middle. So that's a tool that we should build upon since that's a strength as a human. So I just wanted to go over that to set a uh, kind of a frame of mind of how and why we approach things the way that we do in this presentation. So to recap, the goal is to aim for accuracy over precision. It may be beneficial to estimate ranges over trying to give an exact answer. It's maybe less precise, but it's probably more accurate. And then the third point is comparison. Comparing is easier than estimating, especially as a human. And that's going to be paramount to everything we do moving forward. So. Let's get into actual project estimation, why we're all here today to talk about. So before we begin, let's say that we're setting a project estimation meeting. I want to talk about who's involved. At Smart Data, we like to, and it's generally paramount to involve the customer or a product owner that's going to be involved with the project that we're going to be working on. We also like to include a diverse team of developers. And when I say diverse, that can be ranging from different cross-functional skill sets, different levels of experience, junior, mid, senior, aspects like that. And ultimately, the third person that we, well, the third uh, role that we would want there is a facilitator. And generally, that's a scrum master. So. Let's say that we're all in the room together and we're about to get started estimating. While we're still preparing, what we want to do, like I just did with, uh, with giving you a frame of mind with how we're moving towards things with uh, accuracy over precision, we like to create a frame of mind for what it would be like working with the customer, what this project would look like. So as a team, everybody together, we just have an open conversation. You know, ha Has the customer ever been involved in a software development project? What's their experience level? Um, what what does this project kind of look like? What type of customer is this? You know, it could be different industries. It could be somebody that's never been involved with custom software development. It might be a simple uh, website project, or it might be something that's uh, a very complicated integration project. And then, even if the um, customer has been involved with different software development uh, approaches, maybe have they? Have they been ex an experience with Waterfall or Agile, or wh what's that look like? And then if the customer is involved with software development, if they have teams where they work, maybe we can learn a little bit about what their standards are and their ways of working. And this, this will also give us a frame of mind if, as a team that's involved with this project estimation, maybe it comes to mind that, hey, this sounds a lot like another project that we've worked on. Or it might be this is very similar to another customer. And that's just going to give us um, some insight into how we're going to estimate. And that's helpful, again, for comparison purposes. So before we, we really get into estimating, we, we do this framing just to kind of create a, a reference of what it would be like maybe to work with that customer or what that project's going to look like. And we're going to hold that frame of thought throughout the estimation. And here's an example. Um, 
on the whiteboard of one from probably two years ago. Just some quick notes. So for this particular customer and project, we talked about the, what the, how many different environments there are, um, you know, SQL stamp, different coding standards, what that looks like, stored procedures, et cetera. Um, even like this, this client happened to be early on their agile transformation. They worked in a waterfall type methodology. They had a project manager on the team and executives might've been a little bit out of touch with um, different approaches to software development, especially around agile. And here's um, a semi-recent frame that we've done in, in the remote times. We've used a tool here. Um, instead of doing it on a board, we've done it remotely. And we've basically done the same thing. Just a lot of brain dumping notes about ways of working. You can see I've, I've had to cover some things up um, as it's, it's the client that we work with. So I don't want to have any proprietary information on here. But you can see some, some things um, that maybe stick out to you about just gives you a sense of what it would be like working on this project or with this client. So we're all basically on the same page at this point. We have a frame of mind of what this is going to maybe look like as we move into it. So now we talk with the customer or the product owner and we discuss what is the goal? What is the ultimate goal of this endeavor that we're going to be taking together? There might be one main goal and we might break it down into a few sub goals. This is a good time to reflect and ask questions, maybe even negotiate with the, the customer. Maybe they have a grandiose idea and it might be more realistic to um, negotiate or give them a different perspective of how they might approach something, different ideas. And when we get into actually decomposing that goal whether it's breaking it down into sub goals or however we're going to break it down, it's essentially just going to be a brain dump of, a, you could think of it as items or tasks. We're not going to get stuck on um, thinking about features or epics or stories or any of those kind of buzzwords. It's just items is, is how we're going to be thinking of those. And as we're doing this, this would be a good time to ask questions to the customers and other teammates of how we're breaking things down as we're doing it. These items should be captured on a whiteboard. Maybe somebody, the facilitator, the scrum master can be assisting with this, taking notes of the conversation on a whiteboard, helping create these items on cards. But you want to keep it very visual and transparent. And essentially, what you're going to end up with is a lot of cards of either tasks or items or, or things that are to do's essentially that you think will be needed to complete the goal of what we're what the project is going to be. And here's an actual example of how we broke a project down. In this instance, we did a user journey, a flow of what the software would look like. And that was a good way of breaking things down into almost user story levels. And as you can see, there's there's basically a pattern that we've arrived to. And we've we've talked about different different um, areas of, of, of approaches and either or type uh, examples of what might happen in a workflow. Here is another example that we've done, and this is during the remote times. And this is less of a story mapping session, less of a, a user journey and more of just breaking things down into chunks of what we think would be needed. And what's cool about this one in particular, just a side note, is we were actually able to think through what done would look like for these, uh, these items. So after we have talked about the goal and we've decomposed it, we've broken it down into smaller chunks of items or to-dos, however you want to think about that, we're actually going to get into estimating. And the way that we do that is there's a few different estimate types that we're going to use. One is what we call relative comparison of items, 
We also do an expert opinion, or otherwise known as a gut feel. We're also going to compare to past projects. And then ultimately, we want to get the customer's opinion in the room as well. And I've already mentioned it, but we will be comparing all these at the end. So there's definitely a big um, point on comparing that I wanted to mention in the beginning when we were talking about accuracy over precision. Humans are great at compare, comparing, and that's going to be paramount in this technique that we use. So jumping to the first estimate type, I mentioned it as relative comparison of items. So what does that mean? Essentially, we're comparing items based on level of effort. And by level of effort, that could mean taking into consideration factors such as complexity, unknowns, risk, maybe time involved, um, dependencies, aspects like that. And as we're doing this ex exercise, what we'll do is we'll compare one item to the other, and the team will essentially give a quick summary of what one item is before comparing it to the other item. And we will all vote together at the same time of if we think it's higher level of effort, lower level of effort, or the same amount of effort. And I'll give an example here in a moment to illustrate. Ultimately, as I mentioned, we want to vote all at the same time because we don't want to influence each other's votes. For instance, if somebody were to vote, maybe it might take X amount of days to do something. The other person might feel like, whoa, mine's a little high, so I want to lower mine. So that's why we do it all at the same time. As we do this, we'll, we'll form rows of similarity-sized effort items. And I'll show that in the next uh, slide here. And the ultimate goal with this estimate type is we want to come up with time ranges as a team for all the items in the rows. So here's an example. Unfortunately, I had to cover these cards up again for proprietary reasons. But what we've done here is if you look, and I'll use my cursor here, we have an arrow. This is saying this is high level of effort. And then going down here, this is low level of effort. The items here at the top are basically saying that these are higher, higher level of effort than anything below, row-wise. Items that are in the same row are of equal level of effort. So these two items here, the team has decided that they're roughly the same level of effort. And again, when I say level of effort, we're taking into factors such as unknowns, complexity, risk, the size of something, maybe the time involved, et cetera. And as you can see, maybe here down on this row, there were many items that we saw that were pretty equal to each other as far as level, level of effort is concerned. But it's essentially a hierarchy. And uh, feel free to ask any questions as I'm going here, because this, this part can maybe be a little bit confusing. So after we've determined roughly, after we voted as a team together and we've started forming how these would all look relative to each other and some rows have formed of different levels of, um, different levels of effort, what we like to do is ask each individual teammate on the team to estimate a time range of how long they think it would take for them to complete one item in one of those rows. Not all the items in the rows, just one item in one of those rows. So as an example, we had three teammates on this estimate. And what they're saying here is they think maybe to complete one of these items in the top row would take 20 to 40 days. And the same thing for the other teammates. As you can see, as I mentioned, the items at the top are probably going to correspond to a longer time frame to complete because they have a higher level of effort. And the items at the bottom row have a lower level of effort, so they probably will co correspond to um, a smaller estimate and time to completion. And I want to note here that when we do this, we often use time ranges, but that's not always the case. This could also be used if you're if you if you've been on a team together and you've been using 
um, different measurement techniques for comparison other than time, you can also use it here. The most important aspect that I wanted to highlight was just um, comparing items relative to each other, because that can give a lot of insight as we progress onto the project. So here's another example that's a real world example that's not remote. This was a few years ago. We just broke it down on the wall. And then after we broke things into items, we did the same exercise of relative comparison. And you can see these items are the highest level of effort. These are the lowest and everything in between. And we did the same thing where we came up and we asked all the developers in the room to give a, an estimate. And then we ultimately came up with a consensus as a team of what we think based on everybody's answers what we think it would take to complete one of the items in each of these rows. So more formally, this is kind of what it would look like as an example. You might have all these different items that you broke the project down into, multiple developers giving their estimate of what it would take to complete. And then you reach a consensus based on talking about these numbers. And after you've reached a consensus per row, what you can do is you can say, all right, if there is one item in this row and the consensus is it's 10 to 30 days, everything in this row should take 10 to 30 days. So it'd be 10 to 30 times one, essentially. If there's two items in this row, you can just multiply this out. Six to 12 days times two items would be 12 to 24 days. And you do this for all the rows. And then when you have all the totals, you essentially just add all those together and you come up with a grand total time range. In this made up example, you can see that there's quite a large interval between this range, 28 to 72. While that is imprecise, it is likely accurate. And like I highlighted earlier, we're aiming for accuracy over precision. All right, so that was a lot of talk about just relative comparison of items. Just a quick recap, I'm gonna go back here. The goal is that we break things down. We de well, we, we take the goal, we decompose it into items, and then we compare those items of level of effort. And then from there, we're able to come up with some sort of time range estimate. Now, the second estimate type that we're going to use is called expert opinion, or otherwise just a gut feel. We've, we've got some good software developers that work at Smart Data that have a lot of experience on a lot of different projects, and we wanna harness that knowledge and sometimes just from having worked on all this stuff, you have a, a gist of how you think it's gonna look. So what we're gonna do is kind of the same thing that we did with um, estimating on relative comparison. We're gonna ask the team, each one of you write on a card, essentially what you think this might take, the overall time range and or cost, any, any opinion that you have on this project. And then we're going to at the same time, compare all of those cards and see what that looks like. And we'll talk about it and we'll eventually come up with a consensus time range based on our expert opinion or our gut feel. So here's an actual example. As you can see, there's diversity in time, time ranges. One thought six months, one thought four to five, one thought five to eight. So we would talk about that why do you think it was four months versus eight months, et cetera? And then that's how we would talk about things. There's some subjectivity in that conversation to arrive at a final consensus. Here's another example on the board that was actual um, in-room exercise versus on the left, that's during remote times. All right, now we're ready to talk about our third estimate type. And again, we're using comparison, but we're gonna compare it to past projects. So again, um, since we have the ability to track what our past projects have been as far as time frame, the team, the cost, et cetera, what we can do is kind of feel out what this project looks like and say, well, it kind of feels like this project from the past or this project. And each person on the team generally has worked on a variety of different projects that they have knowledge about. So they're able to provide different projects from the past that we can compare to. And we can look at if there's whatever information is available, we can look at 
if we did any framing exercises, what the time frame might have been to complete the goal of that project, what the team looked like, cost, scope, et cetera. And just like how we compared items, we're going to compare projects. So how does it compare? Um, essentially, the, the ultimate answer that we're looking for is time and cost. So if we were to compare two projects here, maybe the team has different projects that they thought of, and we start lining up. Maybe project one was in the middle of time and cost to project three and two. Project three was maybe the highest. Maybe we had a fourth project in mind, and that was similar to project one, et cetera, et cetera. And ultimately, you can compare all those projects and arrive at maybe this project feels similar to this middle row of projects. Maybe these are all in the same kind of time and cost, the size project. Maybe this is a medium-sized one, this is a small one, and these are large projects. So that'll also give us insight into how big this project might be, how much it might cost, and how long it might take. All right, now we move on to our fourth and last technique for our estimate, and that is just the customer's opinion. There is a lot to be um, learned from the customer. So we can ask questions, you know, what did you have in mind? Maybe you, like, maybe it felt like this is a 10-year project, maybe it's a six-month project. We wanna know that because if we're thinking it might be a small project and the customer thinks it's going to be a massive project, there may be um, a divergence there. Maybe we've missed something that we need to talk about. So we'd like to know what the customer opinion is. We also just like to ask, um, do you have any time constraints? Do you have an estimate of what you thought the time frame might be? Do you have any forecast? Do, do you know maybe what, what cost it might look like? Do you have any budgets or budget constraints? Do you, have an idea or a recommendation of what the team might look like. It's just good to get that opinion, and that can be used to compare what the other estimate types are. Like I mentioned earlier, yeah, if a customer's opinion is significantly different from our estimates, it could be an indication that we are missing a piece of information or scope. All right, so we've gone through four different estimate types. Now we're going to compare all of those. So we did a relative comparison of items. We did expert opinion. We compared past projects. We talked about the customer's opinion. And we're going to ultimately arrive at a final estimate. There is no process or formal procedure of how to do this. This is a time where you, you kind of lay everything out in front of you, and you look at all the pieces of information as a team and with the customer there, and you talk things over. And from that, the goal would be to arrive at a final estimate. The things that we might be looking for is what what's maybe the time range? Maybe this is a five to eight month long project. Based on that, maybe it might cost this amount. And we also, as a team, can, as we've learned about this project, we might have a recommendation for what the team size might be or what skill sets might be on the team. All right, so we went through and we did a project estimate. We finished it up. Here's some examples of some actual output. The one on the top is one from an actual exercise that we did at Smart Data. As you can see, we came up with a time range for using our first estimate type, a time range for gut, gut feel. In this example, we actually, I don't believe, Actually, I think we did have a project comparison. I can't remember. This is covered up. We probably did. That's why it's covered up. But in this example, we did not have the client's opinion. They didn't really have an opinion on that. And that's OK. The goal is to try to use as many different estimation types as we can, even if we can't use all of them. And then we compared all these four types, and we came up with an ultimate estimate of maybe it would take one and a half to two months with two developers. Here's another one that we did um, remote. And you can see we came up with a time range with relative comparison estimate. We didn't have a gut feel on this one, and that's okay. 
but we did have comparison to other projects and we had insight from the client. So we took basically these three pieces of information and compared those to arrive at a final estimate. Well, you've done project estimating. Maybe you've even started on the project, but you are not done. Because what's the future going to look like? As we move forward in the, the project, as we get working, it's very important to keep, keep track of how things are looking. And the initial project estimate, estimate is actually going to become less relevant as we progress into the future and forecast into the future. And the reason for that is things change. Um, maybe this could be a time where the, the customer, based on how we're moving, it might be that they want to change the scope. They might want to lower it or they might want to add features, et cetera. So we want to have a tool to not just do the initial project estimate. We want to also be able to forecast into the future so that we can make better decisions and adapt and even maybe change the course of where we initially wanted to go. And one way that we use to forecast is what is called story points. And I'm going to give a quick overview of it, but this could probably have its own discussion. So. If you have questions on story points, probably hold it till the end. I'll do my best to give a, a quick overview of what it looks like, though. Essentially, story points are an abstract way to capture how much effort is involved to complete a task or an item. So it's not directly correlated to time. Rather, you want to think about unknowns, risk, complexity, effort, et cetera. Time may be a, a factor in that, but it is not the main factor. We want to get away from that. And again, when we do this, we want to ask every team member to essentially vote at the same time, and it's a team discussion. The customer should be there if we have any questions. For instance, maybe one team member thinks it's one story point higher than another story point. And with the customer there, they can answer any questions for maybe any uh, deviation for why that person might have thought that. Ultimately, the developers or the team members, if you will, will have the ultimate say in the decision as they are the ones that are going to be taking on the work. So it's very important to have their perspective. And I'm going to do a illustration of how story points might work since that was such a quick overview. So let's say that you're at home. That's our little home there on the right. And we want to go to school. All we have to do is walk down this road. Simple enough. Maybe it would take me five minutes to do, but it might take uh, Joe, who has a break, broken leg, maybe it might take him 15 minutes. But we can agree even though it might take us a different amount of time, the level of effort based on unknowns, complexity, risk, et cetera, we can call that maybe a unit of one. We can maybe agree that that level of effort is a one, even though it might take us a different amount of time. So I'm going to call that one story point, if you will. Now, as another example, let's say that we're at home and we want to walk to the mall. Well, from here to here, it's about the same distance as it is from home to school. There's a curve here, but even so, it's about the same. Ah, but there's actually a pond that we have to get around. So it's a little bit more complex terrain that we have to navigate. So maybe we'll call that a little bit higher level of effort because it's going to take a little bit more time. Maybe we don't know how big the pond is because we haven't walked to the mall in a while. So we'll call that a two. Maybe we can agree that it's a higher level of effort. And as a third example, let's say we're at home and we want to take the kids to the playground. As the previous example to going to the mall, this looks about the same distance, except it doesn't have a pond. This looks like it's even the same distance to the school. So it's like maybe this would be the same level of effort as going to the school. 
ah, but here's the thing is they put a railroad track in last year and we haven't really gone to the playground in a while. We don't know how active that track is. We might, we might try to leave and go to the playground think it's going to take five minutes, but maybe there's a train that comes through and it's a really long train. Who knows? So there's some unknowns there. So based off that, maybe we might say, you know, it's probably higher level of effort than going to school. And it's probably even higher level of effort going to the mall because we there's some unknowns there. So it's really hard to predict. So we take that into account with our score. Maybe we'll call that a three. Hopefully that illustrates how story points are used and how they are used as an abstraction from getting away from time exactly. Because there's a lot of unknowns, especially in software development, and we want to find a tool or way to represent those unknowns. All right, so we talked about story points really quickly. And we're going to talk about velocity, which is directly tied to story points. So you can think of velocity as an average of the amount of story points that a team gets done per a specific interval that we call a sprint. So in other words, let's say that there were five items and the team estimated those items using story points and the total amount of story points for all five items were 20 points. Let's say in the first sprint, which is maybe a week long interval, the team completed all of those 20 points. And then maybe they did the same thing on the second sprint and they maybe completed 25 points. So the average might have been between those two sprints, 25 plus 20 divided by two would be 20, roughly 22 and a half points, but we'd call it 22 points. And that average is essentially the velocity. And it can be used as a tool to as predictability into the future, if it's if it's used right, sometimes um, it can vary. But here's an example of an actual project that we had, where on the bottom here, I'm gonna I'm gonna instead of calling them sprints, I'll just call them weeks. So this was one week, two week, three week. It was just one week of effort. And what the team has done is, in this first week, they completed. 22 points in the second week they completed 24 and the third they completed 29 and so on but when you start averaging these out if you add 22 plus 24 you get divided by 2 is 23 and this red line is representing velocity and what this tells us is perhaps based on this measure using story points we might be able to predict how the team is going to progress into the future so maybe it looks like they've been doing, on average, 22, 23, somewhere in the neighborhood of 22 to maybe 28 points over the course of the entire project. So if we wanted to plan for the next week, maybe we say, you know, let's only take on X amount of items that would add up to between 22 and 28 story points. That's good for planning, and it can also forecast into the future. If you have, let's say, 100 different items, you can attach story points to those items. And based on this velocity, you can figure out, you know, maybe there's 100 story points worth of items in the backlog, and you're knocking about 28 points per, per week. Maybe it'll take you four weeks to knock out those 100 items in the backlog. So yeah, I want to hold questions on story points and velocity because that's probably a that's a big topic there hopefully that painted a good picture of what that how that tool is used so we obviously want to take into account that there's going to be unknowns in the future the future hasn't happened yet we don't know where, what's really going to happen we want to involve the the team in high level planning we don't want to just have this um, between stakeholders or managers, we want to have the team involved essentially because they are going to be the ones doing it. They have a lot of insight. They've been working on it. They're the closest to the project. And as I mentioned before, you can use story points and velocity together to forecast into the future. And I'm going to break this chart down because there's a lot going on here. I'll start with the top. Let's say that we have a project 
and we have broken the project down into all the items that we can think of to get that project completed. Or it might be just to get a feature completed. This black line represents the total amount of story points for either that project or feature, whatever the goal is that we're aiming for. So in this case, I believe it was around 410 points that we were forecasting. This blue line is basically indicating how many points we've completed each week cumulatively. And that's why we call it a burn up chart. So like the first week we got 13 points, then we completed um, 29 more points to get to 42 and et cetera, et cetera. And we're, we've basically completed 190 points for so far and we're about three months in. And what we have here is a green line and a red dotted line. And you can think of this as a spotlight of a forecast into the future that will tell us when we think we're probably going to complete enough story points to get to the 410 points. And this is based on the velocity of the team and any variance in velocity. So that's why there's two lines versus one. It's a range. So we're forecasting, for instance, hey, this will probably complete this amount of points by sometime in November to maybe the first week of December. And as we get closer, this range is going to get tighter and we'll be more precise with our estimate. But the goal is to be accurate with the estimate. That's why a range exists. And if you look, you can even see the uh, lines here get a little bent. We're even able to forecast in if you look at the time frame, you know, we're taking into account the holidays and things like that. So we're really trying to be accurate and as precise as we can be without creating a flawed precision. Another tool that's been used is we've, we've broken down the items in a backlog and then we might have a certain amount of sprints remaining for a time goal or budget reason. And we just use that to start laying out how these sprints might look as we approach these, these goals with the amount of work remaining. Might be an area where there's negotiation where we might find out, you know, we only have six sprints left or six weeks rather. And we have all these items. Let's start chunking them out, laying them out. And each sprint will know if we completed those items and we can adjust the subsequent sprints thereafter and adapt. It's just another tool for forecasting forward. Um, we want to not probably forecast too many sprints forward because things change so much in the future. We don't want to get into um, waterfall practices where we're trying to figure out everything up at front. We're just doing our best with everything we currently know right now, maybe forecasting a, a couple of months forward, but not too far forward, how things might fit on sprints and we'll adjust them as we go. In this example, they actually got creative and they, they called them sprint boats and they had different names for each boat and then the different features for those boats. All right, well, that brings us to the end. So to recap everything, wanted to really nail that we're aiming for accuracy over precision. Um, generally, you'll, c companies will want to know, you know, how much is this going to cost me exactly? They might even be looking for a fixed bid. But realistically, if you're trying to, if you, if you overdo that, you might giving, be giving a flawed precision or in other words, essentially lying. <laughs> I hate to use that word, but you might be accidentally lying if you try to aim for too high of a precision. It's better to be accurate. Always, as we've done, this, this obviously isn't perfect. There's lots of ways to estimate and forecast. We've just gotten to this point, and this is our current ways of working, but it's always adapting. So always take into account that you should always be continuously improving your techniques, and especially in regards to this, your estimating techniques. Humans are great at comparing over estimating. 
And using multiple techniques and comparing them all together is probably going to yield a more accurate estimate than just using one estimating method. You can use story points and velocity uh, to, to forecast in the future. Those are two tools that we use, but there's many other tools available, whatever is comfortable with the team and what actually works. And ultimately, whenever we do this, we, as at Smart Data, we're very agile. We take those values and principles into account with pretty much everything we do. So we're trying to align that. And I like to just talk about some other things. I think, although we talk about how we're agile, I think we're even above and beyond that in some things. And I, I personally take into account some other considerations. Um, when you're estimating, the less you're estimating, the more accurate you'll probably be. It's easier to estimate small goals versus bigger goals. This is an interesting thing that may occur um, as humans when we're looking at doing something. We usually over, or excuse me, we usually underestimate how long it will take to do the whole endeavor at the very beginning. But when we're halfway through working on it, we're usually overestimating how much time it will take to complete the rest of it. Also wanted to say um, it's paramount since we're humans and we're great at comparing, we should always take that strength and utilize it. So I always aim for relative comparison over time estimates. And if you have to use time, try to use time ranges over specific times. Again, talking about accuracy over precision. I also like to use the word forecast over estimate. I think that helps align the team, yourself, the customer, everybody to a certain mindset of what it really is. Um, if you think about weather forecasts, they're not always, they don't always play out to what they were two weeks ago. Um, it's a thing, you know, versus a car estimate for a repair. It's like a fixed bid. So I think although those words do mean the same thing, um, people often have different mindsets of what they actually mean. I also talked about when we estimate, we do it as a team all at once. We don't want to poison the well. That's also the bandwagon effect. There's all, all sorts of cognitive biases. Just be aware of those and try to um, work against those so that they don't influence your estimate adversely. And this is one of my favorites. And basically, it's called Parkinson's Law. And it says that work expands so as to fill the time given for its completion. So in other words, if you, let's talk about meetings. If you schedule a meeting for an hour with a team, usually you're going to use that whole hour. So be mindful of time boxes and use those accordingly. Um, also, as an example for this talk that I'm giving today, I knew that I had till 11.30 to complete this, and I worked right to 11.30 to complete this talk. And that's why, if it was a little rough, that's, that's the reason why. So that's a great example of um, that one in, in motion. And with that, I want to leave it open to any questions anybody might have or any feedback you want to give. If anyone has questions, feel free to use the little raise hand button, and I can call out. I hope you appreciate my terrible dad jokes. I just heard a big laugh from the, the break room for you, Mike. I think you feel better. I enjoyed that. Chris Amon, go ahead. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. I managed to unmute myself. Um, so some question, couple of questions there. How, how do you handle uh, a part of your estimates the non-development activities. So you talked about the developers get together, they create their estimates in different lanes. So are, are, is that just presume things like design, QA, Scrum Master, project management, all those non-development activities, where do they fit in your estimates? That's a good question. It kind of depends on who's in the room and what all we get to talk about and how we break things down when we decompose it. But one of the ways that I try to capture that is when we do framing. Um, 
for instance, if you're working with a client that's very waterfall and very corporate and bureaucratic structured, you might kind of have a frame of mind that there's going to be some latencies built into all the ways of working with them. So feedback or um, scheduling, working with different people, you're probably going to acknowledge in your framing exercise that there's going to be some slowness going on with that client or the vice versa, that it might be speedy. But also when we're decomposing, we try to aim for, at least I do, I try to aim for um, a, what I call a vertical slice of work versus horizontal slices. So when you mentioned, I think you, like if you if you take into account um, like UX, UI design, uh, mockups, wireframes, we try not to split that out into a separate task. We try to include that into the item as a whole. So if there's a feature, you we try to aim for this whole feature for development for. Um, UX design, UI design, the front end, the back end. We try not to split it out by horizontal slices, if that makes sense. And with um, kind of managing the project and aspects like that, that is something we talk about generally at the end when we're comparing things and we're talking about what the team might look like. So between framing, decomposing, and at the end when we compare everything and talk as a team, we try to the best we can account for that. Sure. Uh, my other question was, so you have uh, come up with your estimates and said, this is where what we really uh, expect the effort. But in some projects, you can get a lot of um, third party dependencies. I think of one project we're working on right now, there's five different companies involved uh, working on one single project. And then, um, you know, complexities around security, allocation of resources at times and going through all the approvals and all those kind of things. Um, so especially in the beginning of, a, and then in some projects, you know, they're planning, hey, we need to plan a launch date because we have to have training materials or documentations or things marketing's gonna put stuff online. Um, so uh, you've got a, let's say your estimate is exactly correct in terms of the amount of effort, but how do you know, like, are there any, what are, they're gonna, often you get asked, when can, can we be done by this date, right? Um, so just your thoughts on the timeline of a project versus the estimate um, of the actual effort. And, and if you're not really addressing that here, that, that's fine too. Uh, but I, I just wanted your, your thoughts there. Yeah, um, hopefully I answered this right because there's a few thoughts coming to mind. But I, I actually like to encourage um, I always call it like book the show, find a date, book the show. Um, when you said, when will this be done? The question would be, what's done look like? So, and and the way that we approach things is, yeah, we can book a date um, and we can get there, but maybe the feature set slides if, we're, if we have a time constraint, maybe we can, maybe done changes based on that time. Or if it's a certain amount of feature set that we need to get done, then we might come back and say, well, based on how we're forecasting, the date that you have in mind will not work based on probability in our forecast, aspects like that. Um, also something inherent in how we do this is we have the customer part of our estimation session. So we want them to see the reality of unknowns and how, the, how things really are, just the reality of the situation, Can we get, keeping it very real they get to see how the sausage is made and they might see, you know, if they're even involved in uh, helping answer questions with some of the estimates, they might see, wow, this is kind of unknown. I, I can see why you guys are maybe struggling or why you guys rated that item as a very high level of effort based on the unknowns. So I think between some of those aspects, it might answer that question, but I don't know if I answered that question entirely. I don't, I, I, if, if anyone has the perfect answer to that question, please tell me. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think it's hard questions are always worth discussing. They're going to make that the million dollar question and yeah. they're going to make lots of money when somebody figures that out. Yeah, I think that's why it's it's very important collaboration over, uh, over negotiating, always be involved, be on the same team with the customer, keep things very visible and transparent, um, help them as much as you can in your forecasting, keep them involved with it. 
just keep things realistic and adapt accordingly. And I think that's that's ultimately the best that I think that you can do because the future is ultimately unknown. So just all the tools that you have available and keeping them and not hiding anything, obviously, you never want to do that. Um, keeping it all very transparent is also going to help with that. Any other questions? If you think of more questions and you want to ask offline or you want to have it something very specific to your your team, your project, and you'd like to really discuss that one-on-one, -on -one, uh, Mike has his email address up there on the presentation, mike.miller at smartdata.net. Uh, you can reach out to me uh, or Mike on, on LinkedIn via email. Uh, either way, we'd love to help you out and figure out your questions. But if not, we'll call it early as uh, Mike does love to do. We're going to call it early. And everybody have a great day. Enjoy. Our next Lunch and Learn is going to be August. Or, yeah, August 24th, I believe. Um, and we're going to have it on security and DevOps. So as you move towards the DevOps process, what does security look like? What things do you have to consider at the various steps and when you're planning your DevOps uh, sequence? What does that look like? Where do you want to make those considerations? So watch for that uh, invite to come out. And uh, we'll see you all at the next one. Thanks, everybody, for hanging with me. Have a good day, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Katie. <laughs>